Okay, good morning. My, I, I have eight minutes to tell you my life st lifetime story. <laughs> so here I am, Rujna Baichi. I was here 45 years ago plus as a graduate student, and I can tell you folks, Stanford was a very different place, much more modest, much more modest. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so I, um, but what I am going to talk about it is, and what my group is all about is human, how to human interact with cyber physical systems. And the motivation, I can tell you five years ago when I started, or maybe six or seven years ago, hard to remember <laughs> at my age, um, uh, people said, oh, Baichi, you are crazy. It's too complicated. Humans are, are different. Every person is different. What, what kind of science can you do? Well, I am a roboticist, so I, I am applying robotic technology to human activities. So the scenarios span many levels of complexity from simple tasks, specific com communication to complex dynamic interaction. And we wish to understand the mechanics of these interactions and to design algorithms for control sharing between humans and autonomous systems. And I urge you to see one of the, the posters of Aaron Besdick, who is actually trying to put some sense into this dream that I had. We will illustrate with examples in a number of domains. So, <clears throat> so I had to justify why is this a problem important. A person is a complex kinematic dynamic system, as Michael told you. And I had to come to Stanford to hear Michael that he's looking at the jumping and, and, and and the uh, dynamics of, of humans, but anyway, he told you that the human has, what, 40 or 60 degrees of freedom, depending how you look at it, and, um, and therefore, and, and, the, and all the parameters vary from person to person, and in fact, folks, these parameters change as you age, you know? I mean, I can't do the same thing as many of you can do. Not all degrees of freedom are used in all activities. That's one important component that we can use in our constraint. So the central question is, what is the appropriate representation of human physical action for specific applications. Is there a systematic way to detect and classify what the appropriate sparse representation is for a given class of activities? What feature should be used? What should be the generalized coordinate system? <clears throat> so here is our vision. I don't know how much time I will have to, to give you more details, but so we, we go from the musculoskeletal modeling to kinematic dynamics, kinematics, and agent interaction. And would you believe that a lot of the, the robotic technologies are extremely useful even if you just stay on kinematic modeling? So, so here is one of the human models we are looking at. And I don't know if Katie is here, but she's, she's um, uh, investigating the human interaction in a, in a car, you know, how much you, the, the, the human capabilities uh, affect the driver's safety. That's really our, our... So the big question we have, if we have an idea of the state of the driver, can we develop more intelligent active safety systems? How do we guarantee safety? Safety is a big deal, even for the autonomous cars and um, the, uh, the, the government is not going to approve these autonomous cars unless we can guarantee the safety. How will the autonomous car handle a heterogeneous uh, environment? Oops, what, what happened? Oh, all right. What exactly needs to be known by the autonomous vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a simulator. I will go quickly through this since I have these eight minutes. But let me show you that again, 
you can, you can image the driver and you can detect whether the driver at least physically is distracting, whether you are texting in a car and so forth, and, and um, switch the control to the autonomous, autonomous cars when the driver is distracted and, and then give it back. Okay, so I am going to move on the kinematics because we have some interesting results there. The, the, we have been, you can measure the kinematics of the human and detect some features of joints of, uh, you can detect the joints, not only the, ang um, the angles, but also the velocity. And of course, if you have um, accelerometers, you can even detect some, some torques, although it's not so obvious how you can measure directly the torques since, you know, you can measure it only externally and the, the joints are internal, so the localization of the torques is not so obvious. All right, so we have um, done some experiments, as you can see, and I don't know if Mike is still in the audience, but we have these 11 subjects that did various different ex ex exercises, and we have the data, and we can analyze, and we can detect that actually for different tasks, and I don't know if I will be able to, oh yeah, okay, here. So we can, all right. So you can see that, for example, in punching, certain joints are more energetic, and you can see that, that the joints on the elbows and the, and the, and the shoulders and the wrists are more energetic, but on the other hand, the other joints are not completely silent. So you can create a feature vector for classification purposes of these most significant joints. <clears throat> so we do feature selection, and here is some, some um, um, signs where you can see that which of the joints are more energetic depending on jump, jumping jacks, bend, punch, and so forth and so on. So you can do some classification, and I certainly want to look into what Mike was talking this morning about how you can do this even better. <clears throat> So one application for this kinematic, um, kinematic detection is we have a collaboration with the UC Davis Medical School with the children of muscular dystrophy. I don't know how many of you know what the problem of muscular dystrophy is, but it's a horrible disease which is genetic in nature, and at this point apparently there is no cure, and the children die around age 15 because the muscles get so weakened that crush your skeleton. So at this point, the, 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 what they do is they come to the clinic and they are being observed through a certain protocol of exercise so that you can detect and, and there are some experimental drugs. So what we have done is we have used strictly your common kin forward kinematics that we put on these children and we can measure the reachable space which is, gives the doctors a much more quantitative measure. All right, I am already being told that I am off, so, the, so here is just one example of the healthy subject that you can cover, you know, you can reach your, you can feed yourself, and this is a subject with advanced muscular dystrophy, so we give the doctors, so this is just one, pleasurable example to me that how our technology can be useful. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We are also doing a lot of things with walking and designing kind of small prosthesis for people, you know, of elderly who cannot, you don't have the same torques as the younger people, so talk to us.